This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or The Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. Hey everyone, just a quick announcement before we get started. In case you haven't heard, Reasonably Sound now has a Patreon, a way for you to support the show and make sure it not only keeps happening, but keeps getting better. If you're interested in supporting Reasonably Sound, and I would appreciate it endlessly if you were, you can head over to patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound, all one word, all spelled out to see what's on offer. And of course, to everyone who is already supporting the show, thank you so, so, so much. I can't even begin to describe how humbled I am that you would spend any of your hard-earned cash bucks on this here little show about noises. And actually, speaking of which, enough gushing onto your regularly scheduled podcast. Oh, and actually one other thing before we get started. In the last episode of Reasonably Sound, I said that acousmatic was a term of Michelle Chion's when it is in fact a term of Pierre Schaeffer's, another very smart older French gentleman who wrote a lot of great things about sound, so I just wanted to make sure that I cleared that up or else I won't be able to sleep tonight. Okay, now that that's done, on with the show. I've always been just slightly perturbed by the jazz standard turned faux marketing slogan, I scream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. I mean, I get it. It all rhymes. If rhyming two words, which are almost identical, counts as rhyming. It's all very consonant. I screams phonetic similarity to ice cream makes the whole thing a very novel construction. But I wonder about the situation in which one might scream for ice cream. Like, let's just discuss for a moment the intended message here. Before entering the collective consciousness as a kind of general celebration of frozen dairy treats, Ice Cream, You Scream, We All Scream for Ice Cream was a novelty song written by Howard Johnson, Billy Mole, and Robert A.K. King. It was published in 1927. Making use of several silly voices, it describes a fictional Eskimo college, Ogiwawa, the Eskimo men who attend it, and their leader a man who shouts at them, and they respond, And so on. But, and I mean, not to argue semantics here, but also to just directly and unabashedly argue semantics, is it really screams they'd scream for ice cream and sundaes? Given the range of forceful vocalizations available to humans wishing to communicate all manner of things about ice cream, would one scream and not shout, yell, guffaw? I realize the central reasoning for the song being the way it is, is the very rhyming scheme just discussed. I just, I feel like the scream is not usually celebratory, or really even commanding. Surprised, sure. Exhilarated, maybe. But the scream is not some advertisement of desire. It's not some communique concerning keenness. Were one to scream for ice cream, one would not, I don't think, be having a grand old time. Screaming for ice cream is not, at least, not to my sensibilities, screaming is such that one will hopefully be served ice cream. 
oh please, oh please, ice cream, I would like some ah! is not, it doesn't, it doesn't seem right. Screaming for ice cream is a cry, a shriek, dissipating some impossibly pent up internal pressure. A pressure pushing one to teeter on some brink over which, absent the presence of say, I don't know, mint chocolate chip for much longer, one is surely to plummet. Maybe I'm wrong here, but I think one screams for ice cream not excitedly, but desperately. And only childlike in the way murmuros and fairies scream as Medea approaches, knife in hand. One screams for ice cream the way Lovecraft's explorers and investigators scream at the sight of an unspeakable, indescribable horror. Because even confronted with their own first-hand and embodied experience, the scream is but the only mode of communication capable of expressing or unleashing an appropriate reaction. I can't and won't imagine what manner of ice cream might cause then someone to scream. It probably involves pistachios. This is what we're going to talk about on this episode of Reasonably Sound. Not horrible, unknowable abominations unto ice cream, but rather screams. Horror and fear screams, specifically. What they are, how they work, and what they mean. Sort of in that order. Eventually, we're going to work our way towards talking about how screams function in film, specifically horror films, and specifically, specifically, as delivered by women. But before getting theoretical, let's get physical. Yells and bellows, shouts and barks, and other loud sounds animals with lungs and vocal cords can make are not screams, really. Not as far as we are concerned, and I think not as far as most people are concerned. While it might be largely unconsidered, I think we intuit a massive difference between all of these things. When you use your vocal cords to make sound, but loudly, you're pushing more air through them than is the case during normal speech. More air means a larger, more forceful sound, yet yells and shouts and screams, though similar in that they all fall under the broad description of loud things, are not created or heard equally. A yell or a shout is not a scream. I mean, for one, and I promise this is the last time that we'll argue semantics in this episode, maybe, they're different words. We use them differently. When you meet your friend on the street and he starts talking to you really loudly because he hasn't yet taken out his earbuds, you say, dude, you're shouting. When you and your significant other are having a really heated argument, one of you may say, don't yell at me. But on the other hand, Mark, stop screaming, or don't scream at me, suggest other situations entirely. The word scream converts these imagined situations into ones much more intense. Shouting and yelling are loud, but screaming is desperate. It originates in a place of reflex, not reason, and it sounds different for that fact. Worse, more intense, harder to ignore, impossible to get used to, not just loud. It's sort of like a guitar string, actually. If you pluck a string lightly, you get a soft sound. If you pluck it really hard, a louder sound. More force means more vibration, but there's a point in the increasing application of force where things change. If you pluck really hard, the nice, even vibration of the string is going to become a more complex and wild set of movements which will result in a different sound beyond simply louder. In addition to the fact that if you go really nuts, the string will probably hit some frets and start buzzing or something. Even absent collisions with nearby hardware, a truly tough pluck produces extra noise by virtue of its chaotic movement. Chaos is an important part of this discussion, because the same is true for your voice. Force lots and lots of air by your vocal apparatus, and it will vibrate like crazy. Crazy to the point where it becomes chaotic. 
The technical way of putting it for both guitar strings and your voice is to say that the output of the system and the sounds produced by it become non-linear. Linearity is where you have some system of some kind. The system has an input and an output, and the input matches the output in a very predictable way. Non-linearity is where the input goes into the system, but the output becomes unpredictable, often due to the presence of some amount of, you guessed it, chaos. We're going to spend a little time, actually, using the word non-linearity all casual-like, so for a little clarity, we should digress here just for a moment, lay some semi-technical groundwork. I'll start the music. There we go. So, it would be an understatement to say that non-linearity describes many things. The simple description of a system where the input doesn't match the output belies the million complicated ways in which systems with inputs and outputs, which is to say most systems, can be non-linear. In fact, most systems are non-linear in some respect. Linear systems where we know exactly what's going to happen are sort of like wishful thinking. Linear systems are comforting approximations of a universe beset by disorder. Even systems which seem like they should or could be highly predictable, manufacturing processes, flows of electricity, heat dissipation, even gravity and the passage of time in certain respects, are all systems which deal to certain degrees in chaos and therefore non-linearity. Importantly though, chaos is not randomness. In all of these systems, if we possessed detailed and perfect knowledge of all the factors at work, we could conceivably account for that chaos. Chaos is deterministic. Randomness is not. There is no accounting for randomness. Both it and the Spanish Inquisition are unexpected. The human voice is no different from all of this. Like all of these other systems, you may think, oh, well, we know exactly how that works, but really there is all sorts of underlying pandemonium. The set of things working in concert to produce the human voice as we hear it coming out of a human head hole is not a perfectly linear system to begin with. So when we talk about the voice becoming non-linear, about non-linear vocalizations, we're talking about an additional degree of non-linearity, which causes audible changes in the timbre or quality of the voice. Non-linearity on top of non-linearity, resulting in additional characteristics, in aberrations or pathologies, so to speak. At its base level, this is one thing that makes screams, or non-linear vocalizations, different. A bellow or a howl is loud, but a non-linear vocalization, including maybe a shriek or some cries, they sound distorted. They possess some extra characteristics. In other animal species, those characteristics may be noise, subharmonic frequencies, biphonation, meaning the presence of two fundamental frequencies determining the apparent pitch of the scream. According to Luke Arnall et al. in a paper for The Current Biology Report, human nonlinear vocalizations specifically, brace yourself, quote, result from the bifurcation of regular phonation to a chaotic regime. Basically, that means where normal vocalization contains one tone, screams contain two. A second tone modulates or affects the central vocalized tone in unpredictable ways such that it creates an unpleasant quality, which Arnal and his crew identify as roughness. Where the vibrations of your vocal cords are normally smooth and periodic, during a scream, those vibrations become jagged, non-periodic, chaotic. The roughness that results from this particular kind of non-linearity is a sound akin to what we look for purposefully in things like alarm clocks and other warning sounds, sounds which are meant to be irritating and hard to ignore. This roughness, they explain, exists nowhere else in normal human vocalization, only in screams. Meaning, 
Screams are sonically distinct from other vocalizations, even loud ones. You're not going to mistake a scream for something else. No one's going to scream and you're going to be a couple dozen yards away going, huh, was that, did someone, did someone scream? The point is that they're distinct, very distinct. The shout, the yell, your standard holler is meant to convey some particular message just at a louder volume, but a scream itself is both the medium and the message, so to speak. The scream is not a vehicle for meaning. It is both vehicle and meaning, which is another reason screaming for ice cream seems wrong to me, but we don't have to get back on that track. The kind of meaning exactly that the scream is meant to convey depends on all kinds of things. Who or what is doing the screaming, the context, the type of scream. As Rachel Rosen writes in her paper, the scream, meanings, and excesses in early childhood settings, we have no dictionary for screams. Mostly, as adults, screams are what we, and the rest of the animal kingdom for that matter, use to signal and react to danger. Screaming is a way of preparing our bodies for, and alerting our nearby friends to, imminent demise. Which means when they're deployed in situations where there is no literal, actual danger, some interesting things happen. So you're at the haunted house and you know it's going to happen. There's no mystery here. You paid 15 bucks or whatever. And if it doesn't happen, you're probably going to be a little upset. Someone pretending to be Jason Voorhees or the Texas Chainsaw Massacre guy is going to jump out of a corn patch or a wall hatch and you're going to scream a scream that would curdle blood, milk, orange juice, soda, and maybe even distilled water. Your eyes and mouth are going to open as wide as they possibly can for maximum simultaneous input and output, respectively, and probably you're going to throw your hands up in the air like you care for your safety and the safety of others around you. Oh my god, that guy has a chainsaw. For fun. You're going to do all that for fun. Even though you may consciously know you're not in any real danger, the scream is instinctive. Philosopher Noel Carroll calls this the paradox of fiction. Though we understand the situation to be not real, we still allow ourselves to be affected by it. He was writing about horror movies, but I think this applies here as well, maybe even more so. He explains how we may invest ourselves in fictional situations such that we have frightening thoughts about them without actually believing in those thoughts. To use his terminology, genuine fear does not require genuine belief in, say, Pumpkinhead. Similar to how genuine hopefulness does not require genuine belief in, say, Mark Watney or Katniss Everdeen. So, though it may be faux, that fictional frightening surprise will for real cause your muscles to tense and your pulse to quicken. Screaming tenses the larynx, which controls escaping breath and houses the vocal cords, and requires that the lungs and or diaphragm be filled with air, which is then quickly, dramatically expelled, but not before oxygenating the blood. In the most dramatic screams, the mouth and eyes are opened wide, the head thrown back, the muscles of the neck and back tightened. Fully, the top half of the human body is engaged in the creation of a no-nonsense scream. Screaming is work. Hard work. And so it's also a release. This fact was perhaps most famously exploited by American psychologist Arthur Janoff, creator of so-called primal therapy, a way to deal with mental and emotional trauma by recalling and confronting repressed childhood memories. While confronting these repressed memories and the pain that they cause, patients are encouraged to let out what Janoff called, of course, a primal scream which he claims has distinctive sonic characteristics in comparison to other screams. Yanoff's primal therapy was well known in the 70s. John Lennon and Yoko Ono were two of his most famous patients, but it fell out of style when his results weren't consistently reproducible. But that doesn't mean he was completely off. 
Screaming does have an effect on one's brain, and surely the many people who found solace in Yanov's method were responding to permission given to just let loose via screaming, and the resulting feelings of emotional freedom or expression. According to Wikipedia, actress Diane Cannon apparently had a screaming room built into her home so she could practice her primal therapy without disturbing others. This also sort of explains the kinds of screams performed by some boxers, martial artists, and other athletes. While many of the noises made by pitchers, some tennis players, and certain pugilists are arguably the result of exertion, there is a class of sport-related nonlinear vocalization which is no doubt meant to bolster the energy and concentration of the person doing the work of screaming and sporting. In Phenomenology of a Scream, Peter Schwenger writes that, quote, The scream is a force. It's not a matter of scaring one's opponent, but of adding to the outward directed force of the blow in a way that could not be done by a soundless exhalation of the breath, however abrupt. Whatever destabilizing effects a scream may have on the concentration and poise of the person on the receiving end of that blow is essentially icing. Though nonlinear vocalizations can poke some parts of the brains belonging to people hearing them, Arnall et al. again suggest a possibility that the roughness present in human screams actually triggers a part of the brain which speeds up reactions to danger. They also show how the scream is highly localizable, meaning those nearby are more likely to be able to tell where a scream's source is located in comparison to other sounds. In other words, a scream turns heads, easily becomes the center of attention. The scream is stimulating and intimidating, distracting, and very difficult to ignore by design. A signal of pain, worry, and arguably such an intense physical activity, one which requires commitment from so many parts of the body if performed accurately that it could be construed as an advertisement of capability and of power, of the sheer amount of labor that body is capable of doing, and this in and of itself has a whole other constellation of meaning. In her paper The Hard Work of Screaming from Ethnomusicology, Kelly Tatro talks about the purpose of screaming as it relates to the performance of punk rock in Mexico City. Sure, broadly considered, the purpose of loud, shouty music is what you might expect to, quote, take out the rage to have some form of release and to advertise one's countercultural allegiances through the consumption of music, which is generally non-commercial and thought to be non-commercializable. But beyond these factors, by screaming, these musicians, quote, perform a kind of body work. And in doing that work, Tatro writes, explore alternative notions of labor and value, attempting to enact their anarchist ideals in the context of the post-industrial neoliberal metropolis. Screaming, in this case, becomes nothing less than a fully embodied protest a kind of intense, draining, and expressive labor engaged in as a response to the hot mess traditional notions of labor and economy have left the world in general, and for Tatro and her subjects, Mexico City specifically. Tatro discusses how the, quote, effective impact of a hardworking body in the context of local punk performance incentivizes community members on either side of the stage to focus on a concept of value generated by a community coming together to have these intense, shared experiences, instead of a value handed down by a global capitalism which has left them without sufficient opportunity. Tatro talks about how the scream stimulates not just the bodies of shrieking punk rock vocalists and their fans, but also an alternative economy of affect. We may say that these screams are advertising the bodily capability of those delivering them, sure, but they're also responding to danger. They're a warning of some form, perhaps even as to the presence of some predator, just one much more abstract and engaging in a hunt far more complex and 
protracted than some dude with a mask and a chainsaw. Which brings us, finally, and in conclusion, to horror films and the screams contained therein. The horror movie scream occupies a specific and arguably somewhat regal position in an imagined hierarchy of screams. It's something like the lion's roar of non-linear vocalization, some kind of powerful and evocative ideal representing exactly the source and situation in which it occurs. Except it's not a powerful, majestic beast on some beautiful, wild landscape, but rather a woman, usually vulnerable, probably, and about to meet her maker, potentially. The horror movie scream captures what it means to be instinctive, reflexive, except in some idealized expression. It is about surprise and terror, the scream elevates and then dissipates tension, but does so in some grotesque manner of beauty. The eyes of the scream are wide, of course, the neck tense, the mouth agape, and often the camera trained directly into that chasm, an unhinged jaw open not to consume, but to expel in some very purposefully lit moment of panic. We may even put on our skeptic hats and question how many screams delivered on camera were delivered as heard simultaneously to the picture being taken. Did the screamer re-record their scream in post-production? Was it even the same actress, or are there scream doubles? Useless questions to ask, maybe, but interesting nonetheless, possibly, and ultimately, I think meant to just underscore my personal feeling that the horror movie scream really has more in common with painting than screaming. The horror movie scream isn't silent, but then again, neither is Munch's The Scream or Francis Bacon's study after Velasquez's portrait of Pope Innocent X. These works evoke sound, even if they don't produce it, and exist in the necessarily acoustic environment of the museum. There may be more mute than they are silent, and I think meet Janet Lee and Barbara Steele, famous horror movie screamers, in some para-acoustic middle ground where it's not the sound specifically, but how it's depicted, and the space in which that depiction occurs that creates the most meaning. And most meaningfully, in horror films, unlike paintings, men don't scream. They vocalize, sometimes loudly, often in pain, they call out, and they yell, and maybe, yeah, they scream, but they do not, by the above and aforementioned picturesque ideal, scream. By another standard, perhaps the picaresque and not picturesque, men aren't screamers. Men are shouters, howlers, unfortunate victims, and frequently vulnerable or powerless, but they are not the screaming. Stock sound effects like the Howie scream yeah! and Wilhelm scream ah! may titularly be screams, but to listen to them the way they're used, they don't evoke terror. They're more often punchlines than they are markers for legitimate fright or danger. Men are not screamers because screamers are victims, and at least as far as horror movie tropes go, the guys tend to be a driving force, even if they are also eventually killed. Compare this to the existence of a group of women known as scream queens. It's the dudes who, as Michelle Shion puts it, organize the spectacle on both sides of the camera, but it's the women who are valued, royalized even for their expressions of terror, a terror which often contributes directly to a film's climax. Xi'an in The Voice of Cinema calls this 
the screaming point. Quote, something that generally gushes forth from the mouth of a woman, which, by the way, does not have to be heard, but which, above all, must fall at an appointed spot, explode at a precise moment, at the crossroads of converging plot lines, at the end of an often convoluted trajectory, but calculated to give this point a maximum impact. The film functions like a Rube Goldberg cartoon mechanism full of gears, pistons, chains, and belts. A machine built to give birth to a scream. Of course, there are all kinds of psychoanalytic roads we could go down here. Is the butchering of the scream queen, or the intention to have her or see her butchered, whether or not it's actually gone through with, somehow meant to symbolize a butchering of one's mother? Or maybe the scream is the cutting of the umbilical cord, therefore making it something of a birth scream, which possesses its own very loaded meaning and mythos. But who's being birthed? The director? The audience? The scream? Maybe the female horror scream is ultimately and simply unabashedly sexual. Insofar as the focal point of the scream is the gaping mouth and the victim's body, which, I mean, how could it not be? It may be seen as voyeuristic, subject to some uncomfortable scrutinizing gaze in a moment of utter helplessness. Xian says the screaming point is one where language suddenly becomes extinct. It's the unthinkable inside the thought, the indeterminate inside the spoken, unrepresentability inside representation. It occupies a point in time, but has no duration. The scream, he's arguing, maybe both as naturally occurring and deployed in cinema, is contradictory unto itself. It's meant to communicate, but communicate what, exactly? The scream isn't language, it's pure meaning. Because it's reflexive, a scream occurs whether there is an audience present or not. It's the screamer exercising, as one would a demon, their unthinkable lot generating that pure meaning as a byproduct in the instinctive, non-conscious hope that someone, anyone, may help. In cinema, the most ready candidate, the one most readily affected by the scream, is the viewing audience, who is, likewise, helpless, hostage to frames progressing dispassionately, one after the other in time. The scream takes time especially in cinema, at the precise moment where no more exists. Time is up. It's all over. The scream, highly localizable, begs that one look, but one cannot, not in the movies, until the camera does. The scream is a release, but the scream is also very much a herald of tension. Schwenger, again, says the ultimate irony of the scream is that it's forced from us as a result of the horror of existing in some particular moment. Some moment we, our bodies, are trapped within, but the scream itself is allowed to escape. Expressive, perhaps ear-splittingly so, but ultimately and totally impersonal, disembodied. Referencing, but not constituting, its source. A person, a body, which it has abandoned to endure whatever horror befalls it. One, hopefully, not involving pistachios. My name is Mike Rignetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at ReasonablySND, and you can find Reasonably Sound on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Reasonably Sound. You can find me, Mike Rignetta, at Mike Rignetta on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and Snapchat. <laughs>